promise over in the great beyond, where the saint of earth shall soon the glory share, where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore, everybody will be happy over there, everybody, everybody will be happy, will be happy over there, we will sing, shout, and Back to 177. Yep. yep.
You may be seated. Go down now. this. Amen. Brother Arthur asked that I would sing that song. I hope that he's watching tonight. He said he was going to do his very best to watch, and that was for him. He said that song has been on his heart. And uh, uh, we can try to understand, I guess, what he's going through, but I don't think we could ever imagine that. Um, I think that's something that every individual has to go through, and uh, I'm still trusting in the Lord tonight. In praying for Brother Arthur. Brother Arthur, we love you. If you're watching, we're praying for you and all those that's sick and facing uh, such devastating news of cancer and death and all of those things. Uh, but I can promise you this. One day, the uh, death and pain and funerals, all those things will be a distant memory. One day, we'll take our final breath. We'll cross to the other side, 
And I'm thankful that we don't have to cross the chilly waters of Jordan by ourselves. The Lord, he said he would be there with us. He said he would never leave us. He'd never forsake us, Brother Jeff. And it gives me peace in my heart knowing that I don't have to face what's to come by myself. I'm thankful there's one a lot bigger than me that's able to take me. Amen. And he's able to take you. Anybody else tonight, before we get into the Word of God, uh, we want to be a blessing to you. Uh, we want to uh, mind the Lord tonight. Uh, but we're thankful to be here. Uh, we're praying for Sunday service if the Lord should tarry. Um, excited about baptizing people and watching the youth video. And you're, um, you'll laugh. I'm telling you, some of the pictures we have, especially of your deacon, both of your deacons. Second Peter is where we're going to be tonight. Anybody else before we get into the Word of God? Go ahead, Brother Jim. your heart, Brother Jim. That's your heart. Anyone else tonight? Go ahead. Sure. Amen. 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 Bless your heart. Amen. Anybody else tonight? Brother Randy or Brother Jim said something about, uh, you know, there's things that happen that we don't understand. And I think there's things that happen that we don't need to understand. Because if we understood them, it may change our outlook on things, our opinions concerning things. You know, he made the comment, we don't understand why God chooses to take a child. But what we must realize is that God, death, 
rains on the just as well as the unjust. But God is fair and God is just. And see, God sees what you and I don't see. God sees protection upon maybe that child that was taken from this life. And, and as sad as we are, you look at it as if, you know, what greater thing to happen to a child is to leave this life and go directly to heaven. But we don't see it that way. We see the devastation. Uh, we see the tragedy in the moment. But we have to realize this is we don't see what God sees. And that's when we have to apply the faith that God has given us. I don't understand why my dad has cancer. I don't understand why Arthur has cancer, why Charlotte has cancer, why Jim has cancer. I don't understand why I have to go through a surgery. I don't understand those things, but I accept those things through faith. Because see, if it was what we wanted, we'd never be sick, right? We'd be the perfect weight. <laughs> Our hair would be perfect. Amen? You all think I'm kidding, but if we had our choice, things would be a lot different. We wouldn't age. We wouldn't feel older. We wouldn't have aches and pains, would we? Someone ought to say amen tonight. But see, God knows. Amen. Anybody else this evening? Second Peter is where we're going to be. Not going to read a whole lot of scripture. Just want to give you the introduction to Second Peter. If all minds and hearts are satisfied, I want to just take us back real quickly because in order for me to bring us into 2 Peter and where he's at in writing and who he's writing to and what he's writing about, I must first go back and tell you what we just came through in 1 Peter. Of course, 1 Peter, the author is the Apostle Peter himself. You know, the one that was bold and says, Lord, I'll go with you even unto death. And then when they took Jesus and they arrested him, he, he followed from a distance, didn't he? The Bible says that before the cock crew, he uh, denied the Lord three times. He went out and he wept bitterly. But at that moment, there was something that happened in Peter's life. There was a change. I, I really believe that Peter wanted to serve God, just like so many people today. They want to serve God, but they want to serve God from a distance. And they want the blessings of God but they want to follow from the distance. They, they don't want to get too involved, but yet they'll confess the Lord. Can I tell you that God doesn't want us to be half in or half out? God doesn't want us to be away from him, but he wants us to be near him. Peter found that out, but he found it out the hard way. And of course, you'll read in the book of Acts where Peter preached and thousands of souls come to know Christ, and he realizes the importance of the ministry. Peter has now become a pastor. He is now in Rome writing 1 Peter to a young church. Didn't know much about the Lord. Trying to learn. And Peter's doing his best to teach the importance of serving God. And we find out, we come to read that Peter is writing to a church that has been scattered. I think it would be safe for me as your pastor tonight, as a man of God, as a Christian, to tell you that today's church has been scattered. I really believe that. I think that there's so many types of wind of doctrine that people's just trying to grab hold of anything that would give them peace. And I'm just going to tell you something. It's not about doctrine. It's about the doctor. The only doctrine or doctor that can give you peace is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter makes it very clear. We started uh, 1 Peter in, I believe it was September of last year. There was five chapters, so it took us basically nine months to get through five chapters. Peter's now writing to newer Christians, trying to encourage them because they've been scattered. They're young in the Lord, and they need a pastor. Can I ask you, how important is it for us, the church, Christians, to have a pastor? Now, I didn't say a preacher. A pastor, a shepherd, a shepherd that will lead, a shepherd that will care, a shepherd that will teach. Can I tell you the simplest, I shouldn't say simplest, but the easiest, the most enjoyable part of my calling as a, I'm not going to call it a job, but the calling that God has on my life is preaching the gospel. Because I don't have to do anything but tell you what Jesus said. Tell you what Peter wrote about, Paul wrote about, uh, the, 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 the old saints of God, Moses and 
uh, all of those great saints, all the books, 66 books, that's the greatest part about what I do. The hardest part is trying to lead and shepherd and pastor and care for and tend to and feed. When you get sick, try to, to mend you and heal you. When death comes, trying to encourage you that as long as things are right between you and God, you've got nothing to worry about. You see, that's what a shepherd does. He, he cares for his sheep. But Peter has made it very clear that he's trying to care for his sheep because they've been scattered. And the church today needs a pastor. The area in which we're referring to where Peter wrote this book is a place called Asia Minor. If you had a map in front of you uh, and you would look in the Middle East, you would have Iraq, Iran, and the, 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 the minor, Asia Minor would actually be where today's modern Turkey is. This is where Peter's at, and he's writing to a young church. They're scattered because they've been persecuted. We talked about in chapter number one how that every one of us as Christians will go through trials. I've not been on the road serving the Lord but 28 years. Now, that's a long time, and realistically, it's over half of my life. But I've come to realize this, that all throughout my life as a Christian, I've faced trials. Things that I don't want to go through. Can someone testify tonight that we all face things in life that we're, we don't want to go through, but we have to go through them. But Peter encourages them that there is hope for the future. In chapter 2 of 1 Peter, he talks in, uh, about how that, that we as God's people should desire the sincere milk of the word. We should be hungry to learn more about God. I don't care if you've been serving the Lord 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, or one year, you should have a desire to be fed and to hunger and thirst after the righteousness of God. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after the Word of God. In chapter 3, of course, he goes on, he re writes to us how that we should conduct ourselves and, and how that the Christians should be an example to the world. If there's ever a downfall in the church today is seeing and setting the example to the world. The world's view of a Christian is completely different than the Bible teaches us because of the example or the lack of an example that the church has set to the world. In chapter 4, he talks about how that Christ suffered and how that you and I will also suffer. In chapter 5, he talked about how the elders of the church, the leaders of the church, the preachers, the pastors, the teachers should have one obligation, and that is to feed the flock. If you don't eat, if I don't feed you, if Bobby doesn't feed you, if Micah doesn't feed you, if Jay and Randy and the teachers do not feed you, then guess what's going to happen? You're going to become malnourished. You're going to become weak. And before, eventually, you're going to die. That's what happens. If you stop eating physically, you become malnourished. The doctors told Amy that Art was very, very malnourished because he's not eating the way he should. When you become now nourished, you become weak. Your body begins to basically eat itself to try to survive is what happens. But there comes a point when there's nothing else to absorb and to feed off of before eventually you become weak and you eventually die. That's what happens spiritually to Christians. He talks about also how that not only the elders must feed the sheep, but listen to me, but the saints of God, the sheep must be willing to be taught when we find ourselves at a place in life when where we don't want to be taught we are in a bad place spiritually when you think that you know enough to get you into heaven my friend be careful now we come to chapter or second Peter I want to give you the introduction about what it's about because I believe it's very very important Second Peter is, of course, the second letter of the Apostle Peter writing, and he is most likely in Rome. It's where you will find him. You will find out in chapter 1 around verse 14 where Peter realizes that he's about to die. So he's writing this last letter to the church. Scholars say that Peter most likely died around 
AD 64 or 66 because if he was born any time after 66, the Apostle Paul probably would have mentioned Peter in the writings of 1st and 2nd Timothy. But Paul doesn't write about Peter. So that come, helps us to believe that Peter was probably, his life was probably taken somewhere around 64 or 66 A.D. He is in Rome. He's writing to the church. He's writing to the same believers that he was writing to in First, uh, first Peter uh, in Asia Minor. But he's also writing to a wider audience because the church has grown. And that wider ex uh, audience, listen to me, includes you and I. You, you have to understand that. The time in, in what is happening now, let me, let me give you the demonstration of what has actually happened here. In 1 Peter, he writes about how they were scattered and Peter was trying to encourage them. Now in 2 Peter, he's about to tell them how that they should be aware. He's warning them. There's three areas tonight that I want to talk about. I'm not going to start uh, into 1 Peter, but I, I want to give you all the, some very important areas that we need to be concerned about as a church and as a Christian when it comes to the writings of 2 Peter. 1 Peter, get this, 1 Peter, he's encouraging them. He's encouraging them how to get in, hold on, desire the Word of God, be an example to the world. But now in 2 Peter, he begins to warn them. He begins to warn them of the dangers. The first thing that we need to, uh, to realize in the importance of the church here in 2 Peter, he ends 1 Peter with the church humbling themselves and being willing to be taught. But in chapter 1, we realize here that, he, we, that what we're going to talk about is the importance of a Christian growing. Now, I know he dealt a little bit with that uh, back in 1 Peter, how that we should desire the sincere milk of the word. But now, Peter in chapter number 1 is really going to teach us the importance of growing in Christ. He's warning us that if we don't grow, if we don't learn, if we don't change, listen, you should not be the same person you was when you give your heart to Christ as you are today. If so, you've got some spiritual problems. If a little child doesn't grow and doesn't eat from the time that they were two years old to the time that they were five years old, there's going to be a noticeable physical problem. Listen, here's the sad reality. There's people that's been serving the Lord 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years that are the same as they are or they were when they give their hearts to Christ. Those things should not be. There should be a change. There should be a, a growth period. There should be a difference in our lives. We should know by God's word what is right and what is wrong. We should know what we should do, what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't have to ask the pastor. Right? It's okay to seek advice from the pastor, but man, you ought not come to the pastor every time you're not sure what to do. God's a lot bigger than the pastor. And if you had, would have attended church and listened to the pastor preach, all, answer, all questions you had would have been answered. Out your amen right there. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's what Paul said. So if you're not growing, first of all, it's not the pastor's fault. I'm just going to go ahead and excuse myself. Second of all, it's not God's fault. It's your fault. If you're not growing in the Lord, it's nobody's fault but your own. And Peter is going to teach us in chapter 1 the dangers if we don't grow. Now, the primary verse that we're going to talk about in chapter number 1 comes from verse number 2. You can look there, chapter 1, verse number 2. Peter says this, grace and peace be multiplied. <laughs> Notice he didn't say grace and peace be given to you. He said grace and peace be multiplied. He wants you to abound with grace and peace, right? Through what? The knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. 
Hey, let me, let me just share something with you. You can come to a church and you can say, well, you know what, I just don't get nothing out of your preaching. Okay, then go find you a church. You go to that other church and you'll say, well, I still, I'm just not growing. Well, then you'll decide to go to another church. And come to find out that you've switched churches four or five or six times just to come to realize you're not learning anything. Let me ask you, who's the problem? I'm not the problem. Don't you put the blame on me. I am not the problem. You're the problem. I know you're not. I'm just giving you a hard time. Right. You're the problem. You see, the problem is this. People want to be, when they come to the house of God, when they are preached to, they want to leave feeling good. And you know what? I, leave, I feel good every time I leave here. You want to know why? Because I'm right in the center of God's will doing what God wants me to do. Now, listen, it's not always like that. There's times that I preach that God's actually preaching to me as I'm preaching to you. Did you know that? If I stand up here and preach the Word of God, it's just as good for me to live by as it is for you. And God reveals to us sometimes, preachers, you ought to help me preach. You know what I'm talking about. God will use a message that He's given us for you to help touch our hearts. It does. Hey, point your finger at somebody. Go ahead and point your finger at me. How many's pointing back at you? That's it. One's going out, but there's three coming back right at you. Amen? Thumbs up in the air. But you got three coming back at you. And Peter is trying to encourage us on the importance of growing in the Lord. We said it earlier. What did the Apostle Paul say in Romans chapter uh, 10, verse 17? So then faith cometh by hearing. Let me say this. Let me just throw this out there. You can get mad at me if you want to or not. How can you ever hear and grow if you don't come to church? How can you? How can you hear the Word of God if you don't listen to the Word of God by coming to the house of God? Well, preacher, I can sit at home and listen on the Internet. <laughs> okay. But why would you want to? When you can come and feel it and experience it and live it for yourself, you can put a good, in, a good old Hollywood movie in too and believe it if you want to. Right? The Bible says you can believe a lie and be damned. Well, I don't have to come to church. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, Thou shalt not forsake the assemblings of yourselves. Right? Together, as the manner of some is, especially as you see the day approaching. What day is that? The Lord's coming back. <laughs> the Lord's coming back. So in chapter 1, he's going to talk to us, and we're going to break this down over the next several months about the importance of growing as a Christian. Now, if you have, know some people that need to grow in the Lord, you need to invite them on Wednesday nights at least for the first chapter. Then they can make the decision. The second chapter we're going to talk about, and I believe this is so important. Remember, 1 Peter talks about and encourages the church to hold on. There's hope for the future. Get, encourages them. But now, 2 Peter, chapter number 2, he's going to jerk the rug out from under us. Why is it important for God's people to grow? Because there's danger. There's an adversary, the devil. He is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Amen? Have you experienced the devil's works this week? Well, sure you have. If you're living for God, you've seen it. I've heard people say, man, the devil won't leave me alone. You ought to thank God for that. I'm telling you, when the devil stops bothering you, that's when you begin to start worrying because he's got you. But if he doesn't have you, he'll do everything within his power to discourage you, to steal, to kill, and to destroy who you are. Now, in chapter number 2, we know in chapter 1 he wants us to grow, but why does he want us to grow? Because in chapter 2 he's going to warn us about something that's very dangerous and that's something that's happening to this day. It's the dangers of false teachers. False prophets and false teachers. I don't mean to get political, but there's some well-known ministers that a lot of people grab hold of because they're popular or maybe they're on television or the radio. But there was a preacher, and Brother Jeff knows who I'm talking about, that stood out in Washington, D.C. and preached outside the Capitol saying that Donald Trump would be the president. He felt that in his heart that God told him that Donald Trump would be the president in 2020, just a few days away. You know what that is? 
It is a false prophet. You listen to me. It's a false prophet making false accusations on what comes. Listen, if you're going to prophesy something, you better make sure that it's of God. And if it's of God, it will come to pass. And if it doesn't come to pass, that you're considered false. <laughs> there are a lot of wolves dressed up in sheep clothing. So chapter 2, he's going to we're going to study and read about the importance uh, of um, how to recognize false teachers, okay? Um, do you believe that there are false teachers today? You believe there's plenty of them? Anybody believe there's not false teachers? Well, what makes a false teacher false? They don't follow the Word of God. They're leading you astray. They preach a feel-good religion, a prosperity religion. Huh? Listen, I'm not laying up for myself treasures here. I'm going to lay them up in heaven because that's what the Bible says. Amen? So we, we see that in chapter number 2, he's going to talk about, we're going to learn about false teachers. The key comes in chapter number 2, comes from verse number 1. Now remember who Peter is writing to. He's writing to the church, the church that has been scattered, and now the church has grown, it's gotten wider, and he's now writing not only to them, but it's handed down to you and I. In verse 1 he says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among who? You. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. We'll talk about the dangers of a false teacher. Listen, false teachers are dangerous. Listen to me. False teachers are dangerous because they will lead you to a place of confusion. They'll lead you to a place that you don't understand. They'll give you false hope. But at the end, you'll realize that you have been led astray. That's the importance in chapter 1, why that you need to grow. Let me ask you something. How do you know that what I'm teaching and preaching up here is truth? and not false. You all just assume because all of us agree? Well, I hope not. I, I hope that what I'm preaching, what Bobby preaches and Micah preaches, or what is being taught between Jay and, and, and uh, all the other teachers of the church, I would hope that you will not just take what we say as for truth. Hey, listen to me. The enemy, the devil knows more about the Word of God than any Bible scholar in history. He'll, he knows the Scriptures. He knows them from front to back, from back to front, from top to bottom, and inside and out. And you know what he'll do? He'll use the Scripture. He'll use the Scripture to confuse you. He'll use the Scripture to convince you that what he is saying is actually true. How do I know that? What was the first thing the devil did when Jesus was tempted? He used the Word of God. Did he not? Did he not take him out there and promise him everything? He, he, he was hungry and he said, Hey, if you be the Son of God, take this stone and turn it to bread. But what did Jesus do? The devil wanted to use Scripture for good, he, but he was bad. And what Jesus did, he said, listen, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I'm telling you, the devil will take Scripture. That's why there are so, listen to me, that's why there are so many denominations. There's why, that's why there's so many people that believe so differently. And, and you know what, when you have so many, why was there 12 churches of Asia? Because they did, couldn't agree. Why are there so many denominations today? Because people can't agree on what the Word of God says. Let me, let me just help you with something. There's one way to heaven, there's one way only. 
That's Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul made it very clear. That, listen, I don't know anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified. If you don't believe anything else that I say, believe this, that the only way you're getting to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you will live by that, I promise you, by faith, God will help you what the Word of God says. So in chapter 2, we're going to learn about the dangers of false teachers. We're going to learn about the destruction that a false teacher can bring. Also, we're going to learn about the description of a false teacher. I'm going to say this, and I need you to listen. It is your responsibility as a believer to identify a false teacher. I don't care how well you think they can preach. I don't care how knowledgeable you think they are. Remember, Paul said, I don't come to you with enticing words. Listen, if there's someone that stands up here with these words that you don't understand, you better go home and try to learn what the words that he spoke about mean. I'm just simple. There's a lot of preachers that are a lot more intelligent than me. My son is more intelligent than me. Bobby's more intelligent than me. And you can tell by how they speak. I'm simple. I'm not saying that they're right or wrong. I believe they're great. I believe we've got some of the best right here at Centerburg. And I'm blessed by their preaching. And I'm glad, I'm glad that God didn't call us, all three of us, to preach the same way. Could you imagine how boring that would be? Of course, I don't know if the Word of God could ever be boring. So we'll learn these things. Before we move on to what chapter 3 is about, what is a false teacher? What is a false teacher? Let me give you something real simple. Simple. A false teacher is anything or anyone that teaches the opposite of God's Word. That's what a false teacher is. Anything that's false, that doesn't line up to the Word of God. You know, the Bible teaches us to test the spirits to see if they be of God. You should know by your spirit if it bears witness with somebody else's. Did you know that? That's the instinct that God has given Christians. If there's something that a preacher or a teacher says that you're like, wait a minute, that didn't make sense. Make no sense. Right? Who'd that sound like? Rich Moore. Don't make no sense, right? So what you should do is just not brush it off. You should go study it and find out. Is it true? Is it false? What he said, is it, does it match up with the Word of God? That's how you'll know. And then, of course, chapter 3. I, I believe this is very, very prevalent today. Chapter 1, we talk, we're going to talk about the importance of growing. Chapter 2, we're going to talk about identifying false teachers. And chapter 3, I believe that we're in this time already. We're going to learn about the mockery that's occurring in the church or toward the church. The key verse in chapter 3 comes from verse number 3. Peter says this, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, scoffers, walking after their own lusts. You know what a scoffer is? It's a mocker, someone that mocks. You know what? There's people, there's government officials that actually mock the church. They actually think that they, when they feel as if they have authority over the church, do you know that they're actually mocking the church? Listen, God's the only one that has authority over his church, regardless of what the government says or anybody else says. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. That word scoffers actually means to mock, and they walk after their own lusts. Now, I'm going to end with this. If you haven't noticed it, it's amongst us today. It's amongst us. The mockery of the church. So I don't know about you, but I'm, in, I'm, I'm excited about what we're going to learn here in 2 Peter. 1 Peter, remember, he's told them the importance of hanging in there, persevering, encouraging them. Now, 2 Peter is going to be about warning. And I'm telling you, church, we ought to be just like the man that stood up, Hezekiah, which one was stood with a sword in his hand, as he, Nehemiah, as he built the wall. 
Remember Nehemiah? He fought the battle and with a sword in his hand as he built the wall on the other. We need some watchmen on the wall looking out for the dangers. We ought to look out for dangers inside the church. Hey, if you all think that everyone that walks through the door sits in a pew and, and takes membership at, ship of a church are Christians, well, you ought to maybe just listen a little bit and examine. And I promise you, if you'll do that, listen, I'm not talking about judging their sin, for we've all sinned, right? I'm not talking about making mistakes. I'm talking about listening to them. What's coming out of their mouth? The lives that they're living. Does it line up with this? Right? And if it doesn't, then you ought to be aware of it. That's what we're going to talk about. Peter's going to help us to do that, okay? With that being said, let's stand tonight.